Okay, so hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. A uh, very warm welcome to Dow Medical College alumni uh, CPD webinar series. Um, this is the first time we are uh, open to uh, public, which means that previously we had been doing these sessions uh, within our uh, own uh, class uh, alumni. And we've decided to open this to public so others can also benefit other hospitals. And uh, so this is our, our, our first session uh, where this webinar is open to um, other members of this side of our class. Now, uh, just a couple of things, a uh, few things uh, about these sessions. So these are multidisciplinary uh, uh, CPDs. Uh, uh, one hour of CPD uh, with two talks. There are two speakers, 20 minutes each, uh, followed by a Q&A session uh, with the speakers. These webinars are held once a month. You uh, 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 second Sunday of each month, and uh, uh, they start at around 5 p.m. UK time. The program coordinator, and the facilitator uh, is uh, Dr. Mansoor Ali, uh, who, is, uh, who is with us and person responsible for coordination of speaker arrangement and everything. Um, Mansoor Ali is a renal consultant in England and uh, very good. Uh, so the, the topics that we cover in, this, uh, in these webinars are very, very broad from cardiac arrhythmias, to uh, diagnostic picture testing quiz sessions, to public health initiatives in Pakistan, uh, to uh, acute kidney injuries, uh, and also non-clinical topics as well, uh, such as the one we have today on, on uh, challenges of life and so on. So they are a mixture of non-clinical and clinical uh, sessions, CPDs. We also have a YouTube, so if you want to watch these uh, video, these sessions afterwards, we upload them on our YouTube channel. Just Google uh, the YouTube, just put Dow 2002 and you will find us uh, and, and all the previous sessions. D-O-W-2-0-0. Um, we sometimes uh, take uh, a screenshot as a proof of evidence or attendance of delegates. And, and if you, if for any reason you do not want to be in that screenshot, the simple solution is just switch off your video and you can continue to watch our sessions. And the reason we take a screenshot is because we are trying to formally recognize these from Royal colleges, etc., And we are collecting all the evidence and ask us for the proof of, you know, how many people have attended these sessions and show us proof and everything. So some people may not want to have the been screenshot so you simply switch off the video. So um, without any further delay, I'm going to introduce uh, our first speaker, who is Dr. Stella Zia, a good friend of, of mine uh, from, from Dow Medical College, 2002 batch. And Subella is a pulmonary and critical care physician in, uh, in the USA, in Illinois. And she's going to give us an update on COVID-19 management. Sabella is, needs to be unmuted and the same. Sabella is on yep. mute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Nassim. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can, Sabella. Yes. yes. So I'm going to talk about uh, COVID-19 uh, disease in patient management. Uh, update, and this is going to be the roadmap of my um, presentation. It's a tall order, but I'll try to be as uh, time efficient as possible. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, you may want to save them for our question and answer session. That's fine. Um, but if you want to ask them in the middle of the uh, presentation, that will be cool too. Um, so moving along here. Uh, can you share? Can you guys see my screen too? No. Yeah, perfect. Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so as we all know that COVID disease 2019 is caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. Initially, this uh, disease emerged in Wuhan, China in late 2019 and has now spread across the globe. Um, and as of this weekend, globally, there were 21 million cases across the globe. And of those 21 cases, two, uh, close to 294,000 cases were diagnosed within last 24 hours. So on a daily basis, there has been still a high rate of uh, disease uh, in new people. Um, and of those uh, uh, 21 million people, at least uh, there have been uh, 755,000 deaths. And of those deaths, uh, close to uh, 9,000 deaths were within last uh, uh, 24 hours. And this is a slide showing a world map of uh, um, COVID-19 distribution. And as you could see that uh, U USA has been a hot, hot spot for the longest with more than 100,000 cases. And other countries like Brazil and India have also been um, in that range in last seven days, they had the highest number of uh, new cases reported within last seven days. So estimated uh, incubation period is up to 14 days from the time of exposure with mean incubation period of four to five days. All age groups can get infected with COVID-19 uh, and end up with severe disease. Um, probability of serious COVID-19 disease is however higher in patients who are uh, 60 years uh, or elder, uh, people from nursing home or long-term care facilities, those with chronic medical conditions, obesity, racial and ethnic minorities, uh, they are much higher risk of uh, um, COVID-19. Um, and then this is a study that looked at the death rate of uh, patients who, uh, with COVID-19 and specific uh, pre-existing conditions. And it seemed, uh, and uh, it showed that patients with cardiovascular disease were the highest uh, ones with mortality at 10%, uh, followed by diabetes, chronic, uh, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, and cancer. However, what is remarkable is that patients with no pre-existing conditions, uh, they fared much better in terms of the mortality, with mortality being less than 1%. Um, also, this is the uh, morbidity mortality report uh, from uh, June 2015, and it showed that hospitalizations were six times higher and deaths was 12 times higher for COVID-19 patients with reported underlying conditions. Um, and uh, most frequently, especially in cardiovascular disease, diabetes and chronic lung disease. Um, and we all know that the roots of SARS coronavirus transmission um, has been primarily through respiratory secretions and to a lesser extent, uh, contact with contaminated uh, surfaces has also been uh, noted to uh, transmit the disease. As for uh, face mask, social distancing are the um, standard measures of uh, disease prevention. Um, and uh, this one talks about the COVID-19 spectrum of illness. Um, so it can be anywhere from um, asymptomatic uh, or pre-symptomatic stage where patients uh, only have a test positive for SARS coronavirus 2, but they, are, they have no symptoms uh, per se, uh, followed by a mild stage where patients would have COVID-19 symptoms like fever, sore throat, cough, um, but no shortness of breath, tachypnea, or abnormal chest imaging. Um, and then comes the moderate stage where you start seeing the lower uh, respiratory disease uh, by either clinical assessment with shortness of breath, tachypnea, or chest uh, imaging uh, showing infiltrates and a saturation of oxygen does not drop below 94%. Um, however, once we move into the severe spectrum, you start seeing patients with tachypnea 30 uh, per minute uh, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation uh, would be less than 94% in order to qualify for severe uh, disease, as well as the uh, P2F ratio would be uh, less than 300, and there'll be lung infiltrates as well. Uh, on the chest imaging. And last but not the least, uh, there will be a cl critical spectrum of illness where you would see a respiratory failure, septic shock, multiple organ dysfunction as, um, as well. So we all know the clinical features uh, uh, by now very well. Initially, it was thought to be a pulmonary disease, but then other um, organ symptoms were also involved. So 
um, and most um, most common was the cardiac disease, where, uh, cardiac one where you would see arrhythmias, heart attack, and uh, a myocardial infarction. Throm thromboembolic events also occurred in patients with COVID-19 in the highest risk in uh, critical care uh, patients, especially in the ICU. Long-term sequences were have still not been known. However, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is something that has been um, reported anecdotally here and there. Um, th there have been GI involvement as well as renal involvement. Um, uh, one, one thing uh, which is note noteworthy is that although renal abnormalities, most of them did resolve within the th three weeks after the COVID-19 and uh, renal uh, disease onset, However, those who had those complications uh, and did not improve were at higher uh, risk of mortality as compared to the others. And this is a diagram that is uh, uh, sh going to show the um, co COVID-19 cardiac manifestations that I was talking about, that there are different uh, pathways for different kind of uh, um, uh, cardiac complications. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this slide and go to the myo fact that the myocardial uh, injury gives us the worst prognosis, um, which is myocardial injury is indicated more by um, troponin I leak and the leakage of uh, B BNP. And if patients who have uh, these things either in the uh, in the middle of the disease or in the later spectrum are at five times higher risk of having mortality as compared to those without it. Um, and also uh, um, that as well. So, and then I am going to just pause here for one minute. I bear with me for something. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I'm going to here. Uh, how do I start sharing my screen again? Because I realized that this is a can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, yes. Okay. Yeah, so this was the, um, I'm going to skip there because that one was giving me somehow here. So, sorry about this. Um, so dermatologic manifestations um, like ma macular hemorrhage rash on the leg, legs and macular papular itchy rashes. Um, have also been report, reported in the literature. And then we all know about the neurologic manifestations like in, uh, anosmia, headache, stroke, seizures, etc. These are the common uh, laboratory findings of COVID-19 where pe people would have uh, leukopenia, lympho uh, lymphopenia, and elevated levels of uh, C-reactive protein, elevated D-dimers, etc. However, in, in patients with severe or fatal COVID-19. There's a bunch of lab abnormalities uh, which are reported and I'm not going to go to, into the details. Um, as far as the radiological findings are concerned, you can see anywhere from either a focal ground glass opacities uh, with peripheral bilateral ground glass opacities uh, having crazy paving appearance um, because of the interlobular septal thickening to consol bilateral consolidation, sometimes cyst uh, cystic appearance as well, as well as this was a fulminant disease where patient had bilateral diffuse uh, ground glass opacities with the um, a complete whitening of the of the lungs and patient died after that. This is, a, um, this is a study that showed the distribution of various patterns of lung changes depending upon the timeline of the disease from the symptom onset as the disease progressed. So uh, group one had got the CAT scan before symptom onset and the most common finding in earlier disease was the or in the asymptomatic people were the ground glass opacities. But as the time progressed, you guys could see that um, the ground glass opacity uh, incidence went down and it was, uh, and you started seeing um, consolidation and the mix of consolidation uh, followed by reticular stages in the earlier, uh, in the later half. Um, and then we are going to talk about the treatment guidelines. Uh, these are the one of the most robust guidelines that are available here. 
um, and who came up with these guidelines. This was a very wide collaboration amongst different professional societies. You could see the list as well as different government, federal government agencies, including the Department of Defense and uh, FDA, etc. According to these guidelines, um, the prevention and prophylaxis of SARS coronavirus 2 infection is not recommended. There's no need for any pre exposure or post exposure prophylaxis at all. Um, and let's talk about the treatment. As of today, there are no FD approved drugs for the treatment of COVID 19. Um, and but there are several promising agents. So let's look, take a look at them. Um, number one is the one is remdesivir. Remdesivir is an antiviral um, IV drug, which is an investigational a nucleotide prodrug of an adenosine analog. And it has wide uh, activity against viruses like Ebola and Middle East uh, respiratory coronavirus syndrome. Um, so the promising results started coming um, uh, in May 2020 uh, about remdesivir before it was being used on a compassionate basis only on, in severe uh, uh, or critically ill patients. But when the, once the results of this trial called the Adapted uh, COVID-19 Treatment Trial or ACT-1 trial came, uh, came out, um, th these are still the preliminary findings. They, sh they showed that uh, patients uh, who were hospitalized with COVID-19 tests uh, and who received Remdesivir, uh, 200 milligrams loading dose on day one, followed by 100 milligrams for up to nine additional days. Though that group had shorter median recovery time, 11 days versus 15 days, that group also had reduced mortality by day 14 um, as compared to the placebo group and less side effects. As uh, while we are talking of side effects, most common side effects um, of remdesivir were anemia, AKI, pyrexia, hyperglycemia, and elevated ALT, AST. Um, based on that trial, the guidelines had to be revised, um, and the latest guidelines for remdesivir use um, are accounting for the patient's supplemental oxygen requirements and the mode of oxygen delivery. So previously patients who were on high flow oxygen, mechanical ventilator or ECMO, they were the ones who were going to get the remdesivir. However, however according to the current guidelines based on the ACT-1 trial, um, patients who are requiring the, uh, supplemental oxygen, who are not far along the spectrum, they are the ones who should be prioritized for remdesivir. Um, and remdesivir should be given for five days or until hospital discharge, whichever comes first. However, if a patient is on supplemental oxygen while receiving remdesivir, and then he, uh, pay, he or she uh, clinically gets worse, requiring higher level of oxygen, like high flow oxygen can uh, cannula um, or um, non-invasive or invasive mechanical ve ventilation, including ECMO, the dose, if you have already started the remdesivir, complete the course. Um, patients uh, who are uh, who did not get remdesivir and who have high requirement of oxygen and are requiring high flow oxygen, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, ventilation or mechanical ventilation ECMO, there they are there are conflicting results and there is uncertainty whether the remdesivir should be started in that group or not. Um, so there was no recommendation made. Um, if patients who have already received remdesivir after five days of therapy and have not received at all, there were, there's no optimal duration for remdesivir that is recommended. However, there are, it's an expert opinion that some of the uh, experts recommend using total remdesivir to, uh, treatment up to 10 days um, as well. And uh, it also depends upon the supply that your region got for the remdesivir. Um, Let's move and talk and move on to immune-based therapy. Uh, as we all know that given the hyperactive inflammatory effects of SARS uh, co uh, coronavirus 2, agents that, uh, that modulate the immune response are being explored as adjunctive treatments for the management of moderate to critical COVID-19. Um, so we have heard a lot of about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, and we'll talk about that we are not going to use them. Um, and uh, 
the one agent that has shown promise is uh, to uh, tocilizumab, and we are going to talk a little bit about that in a bit as well. Um, immune-based, so when we talk about immune-based therapy, we are going to look at uh, human blood drive products which are obtained from individuals who have recovered from uh, SARS coronavirus 2 infection like um, convalescent plasma or immunoglobulin products, immunomodulatory therapy uh, like mesenchymal stem cells, glucocorticoids, targeted anti-inflammatory treatments such as um, interleukin inhibitors, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, etc. So let's look at dexamethasone preliminary report of dextramethasone trial, which is called the recovery trial or the random evaluation of COVID-19 therapy trial, came out last month. It was a very large, uh, large multi-center open label trial uh, conducted in being uh, conducted in UK. In this trial, they looked at hospitalized patients who were either suspected, they, were, they didn't have to be positive for the test. They, you just have to have a clinical suspicion for corona or they have to have been lab confirmed uh, COVID-19. And they were assigned in a two is to one ratio to uh, for every two patients for in standard usual care was uh, there was one patient that was recruited in the IV dexamethasone group, uh, six milligrams per day for 10 days. And the primary outcome was that the dexamethasone group had lower 28 day mortality among those who were receiving either invasive mechanical ventilation or oxygen alone. Uh, but were not among those uh, receiving no kind of um, respiratory support at all. Uh, and the secondary outcome showed that the dexamethasone group had more people discharged from the hospital in a good way in, in within 28 days and less invasive, uh, less invasive mechanical ventilator uh, requirement or death was reported. And this, and you could see here as well in the diagram that uh, invasive. Um, this is on the x-axis. Uh, on the x-axis, you will see the days since randomization. On the y-axis, you see the mortality. And the red one is the dexamethasone group. And I, you could see in patients who were on invasive mechanical ventilation, the dexamethasone group fared much better in terms of mortality as the, the usual care group. And the same was the case with the oxygen only. Uh, there was a trend towards improvement with the dexamethasone group at, uh, instead of the usual care. However, what is remarkable here is that there is a potential harm um, trend noted in the patients who had dexamethasone but were not on any oxygen at all. Um, so um, based on this, the uh, the recommendations were recently updated um, back in July, and they are recommending using dexamethasone six milligrams per day for up to 10 days for the treatment of uh, COVID-19 mechanically ventilated patients, and also in patients who are on oxygen supplementations. Um, and they are recommending against the use for the treatment of COVID-19 in patients who are not on any kind of oxygen, okay? Um, if dexamethasone is not available for some reason, uh, consider using prednisone, methylprednisolone, or hydrocortisone. What is even um, more remarkable is that uh, given the potential benefit of uh, decrease in maternal mortality and low risk of uh, fetal adverse effects for this short course of therapy, um, they are recommending dexamethasone uh, to be used in pregnant uh, patients who are um, with COVID-19 who are either mechanically ventilated or meeting the criteria for supplemental oxygen. Um, let's look at the convalescent plasma therapy. There has been lots of interest about the convalescent, convalescent plasma therapy. Um, so the idea is that the patients who have already recovered from COVID-19, those, uh, those patients should have the SARS coronavirus 2 neutralizing antibodies. And so they donate blood. And of those, um, uh, from that, we extract the plasma and give it to a, an ABO compatible uh, patient who is who is having active COVID-19 uh, infection with the hope that these uh, these antibodies once in infused in the recipient would help uh, facilitate the uh, recovery course. So currently there has there's a very large program called National Expanded Access Program which is ongoing in America. It's sponsored by uh, Mayo Clinic. We are uh, Southern Illinois Healthcare where I work is also part of this access program, and we have been a, we are enrolling patients in there 
um, um, in this program um, as well. And I'm sure some of other my other colleagues from uh, United States must be part of this um, program. So the criteria that uh, is used for the plasma donors is that the donor should have a documented COVID-19 with complete resolution of symptoms for 14 days before donation and either no history or history of uh, no history of pregnancy or a negative HLA test after a donor's most recent pr uh, pregnancy. Also, they sh uh, the, the SARS coronavirus antibody uh, testing for plasma uh, donors and assessment is not required. Required, we are not checking it because it takes several days. Uh, in the absence of uh, ABO compatible plasma, uh, patients may either receive group A plasma or low anti titer A group O plasma as available. The criteria for the uh, the recipient criteria is the laboratory confirmed uh, laboratory confirmed uh, COVID nineteen uh, diagnosis is mandatory, and the patient should be uh, should have a severe or immediate life threatening COVID nineteen disease. And of course, we need a consent. We can't do anything about without it. Um, and uh, recently, there was this a safety analysis that was published for the first. Uh, 20,000 patients who received open label COVID-19 therapy. And uh, it showed that uh, so far it has, uh, there has been a very low incidence of less than 1% of serious transfusion reactions. And the way these uh, uh, serious adverse effects, uh, uh, events are reported is uh, first uh, we check them at four hours and then at seven days after transfusion or as they occur. And, and there's a dedicated nurse who's doing that. Well, you have one more minute. Okay, so um, uh, for as far as the tosil, uh, so we are going to skip to through the tosil, uh, tosilizumab and because tosilizumab map comes the uh, inflammatory storm through blood receptors. And uh, we are going to talk about the conclusion. Okay, as far as the, um, in the conclusion, COVID-19 is a multi-system disease it mainly presents as respiratory symptoms, but other organs may be involved. And remdesivir for five days should be prioritized when patients are on supplemental oxygen via nasal can cannula. And uh, we know that dexamethasone, uh, six milligrams per day for up to 10 days for COVID-19 patients on mechanical ventilation and on uh, supplemental oxygen. Uh, tocilizumab is promising, but it is not recommended and there's no recommendation so far. And one thing I wanted to really make a note of that ARDS in COVID-19 patients is not like the regular ARDS. And it uh, so the ventilator management should be tailored according to the category that it is in. And one of the reasons why most, there is a thought process why most patients died once they, once they went in the ICU was that maybe the manage, we didn't realize it early on that not all of them needed low, um, low tidal volume. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, no, no, now we skip. Thank you very much, Subala. Yes, thank you. Uh, we will take questions uh, uh, later. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> so, our next speaker is Bik. Uh, Dr. Intesar Malik graduated from Pakistan, worked there, and then he uh, moved to England, where I met him. We worked together for, for, for many years. Uh, subsequently, he, he then moved to New Zealand. Now he is in Saudi Arabia. So he has experience of working in many different countries, three continents. And his talk is, is about uh, uh, stuff that we, we don't usually get taught in medical schools and colleges about the challenges of, uh, uh, of consultants' life. Uh, most of us are consultants or, or family care practitioners. And we deal with difficult colleagues. We have challenges of managing our work and life balance. We have uh, our career pro progression and career promotion ambitions uh, in our mind and, and many other things, time management. So I asked him to give us a, a, a very brief overview, his vision and also his suggestions on some of the key challenges faced by new consultants and also people who have been consultants for some time. And I'm very grateful that he is uh, uh, he's, uh, uh, with us today. So over. Uh, thank you very much, Nasim, for a <clears throat> very kind uh, introduction. Uh, good evening to the friends in uh, uh, UK and, and good morning to the friends in the uh, US. 
My name is Intasar Malik. Um, I have worked as a consultant in NHS England for a year, in NHS Scotland for seven to eight years, uh, in New Zealand for five years, and in Saudi Arabia for the last year. So, so I have a pretty extensive experience, you can say, or a taste of uh, practicing medicine and seeing these challenges in different parts of the world. Uh, the time is limited and I'll try to stay on time. And, and I've picked basic five, uh, you can say points, which I discuss with you. The first one is a job plan and the job size. When you become a consultant or you're an established consultant, uh, you have got a job plan. Uh, which is given to you by your trust and over a period of time that job plan starts to grow at its own and if you look at your job plan uh, especially in the UK uh, you have got DCC which is a direct uh, contact with the patient uh, or direct clinical care and then you have got an SPA which is a supported professional activities so that this is different trust have got different splits in, a, in an ideal world you should have a seven dcc and three spas but with the new uh, contracts you can see people are getting less spas so you need to know your uh, uh, job plan and then my advice is to keep a diary of the activities so so each day when you finish your work you see where were you how many time you have spent in giving the, um, answering the emails, phone calls, speaking to the patients, secretarial work, whatever, speaking to the juniors. So, so make this uh, a diary because this diary, if you are maintaining it for two months, three months, six months, it's a very good starting point because when you are going to review your job after a year with your managers, you will have a sufficient evidence to suggest that you are working this amount of work and you are paying this amount of work. Either they are going to decrease some of your workload or they are going to pay you for the extra work you're doing. So it's very, very important that you document all this. And you need to be a member of a trade union. Um, in, in, in the UK, you have got a British Medical Association. Um, in, in New Zealand, it is a Mecca. There, there will be some of these organizations in the US as well. So be a member of the trade union because they can negotiate on your behalf. They, they know the technical terms and, and the, your organizations are afraid of them dealing with them. So, so that what is the most important thing to do. Then we move to the care, career progression and promotions. Uh, when you become a new consultant, you are full of aspirations. You want to do things. You want to change the world. Uh, you want to become the best physician and all those. And, and that's very true. You, you, you can achieve everything. My advice is that if you want to progress in your career and, and so you need to be involved in the medical education, you need to be involved in teaching medical students. So you, when, when you start a new job, you find which university is attached to your hospital or your organizations and the medical students are coming and you they will not come to you. You need to go to them and, and offer your services. As I um, uh, advised Nassim when he started his job as a consultant many years back. So you gather the medical students, you speak to the university and get involved with that. And by doing that, you will get an honorary status with the university, which will be good for your CV, that honorary senior lecturer, honorary lecturer. Then you need to be involved with the Royal Colleges, uh, especially in the UK, uh, to become an examiner of your speciality. Uh, that's very good because that look, looks, looks very good on your CV, but then it also gives you a vast amount of uh, networking. You will meet people from your speciality from different places and, and some of them are uh, very key people in that uh, uh, I would say speciality like professors or and, and you discuss with them you speak with them and you learn a lot you see the patients you see the candidates so, so it's a very good activity and I would advise after becoming a consultant for a year two years three years whatever your is uh, you become an examiner of the Royal Colleges 
and then working for the regulator if you get the chance to uh, work for the general medical council or I, I worked for the new zealand medical council so that is very very rewarding and that's good you can also become an appraiser because in uk now this revalidation appraisal is on the go so you can develop an appraiser role and and if the post comes for head of department uh, clinical director you can apply for that and if you have got these things on your uh, cv you will stand a better chance as a consultant you will be managing junior doctors they would be the registrars they will be other junior doctors like senior house officers or now we call them uh, imts internal medical trainees foundation doctors so so the, the, and you have to do their routine assessments. You might be their clinical supervisor, you might be their educational supervisor, and you would be asked to do routine assessments with them on times, like uh, direct observations of the practical skills, mini CACs, uh, case-based discussions. So you have to do that. And the most important thing you have to remember as a consultant is to give an effective feedback. Because these all exercises are useless to the trainee unless they get a proper effective feedback and as a consultant you need to give that and to do that you need to be trained in doing that you need to go to the courses need to learn this is a skill this is like a driving skill this is like a flying so you need to learn this effective feedback how to give it uh, to the trainees it should be non-threatening it should be open-ended so, so you will learn that then you will be at times uh, faced with a dilemma where the trainees are in difficulty. Um, there are two types of the trainees. One trainees who lack in the knowledge, who lack in the clinical skills, they are dangerous. So those are the dog things. And the other group of the trainees in difficulty, I would call the trainees who have got attitude problems. They are very good doctors. They're exceptionally good doctors, but they have got an attitude problem. Uh, they are rude. Uh, they are arrogant. Uh, they don't listen to you they try to undermine you and these are very difficult people to deal with and my advice when you're dealing with them is 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 set up a meeting with them and uh, discuss that with them very openly and you need to, the trainees who have got lack of knowledge you need to put a strategy for them that they need to study they need to go on a course they need to do that or they need to have a peer support which you can arrange for them. The people who have got attitude problems, sometimes they don't have an insight. Uh, and that is a very difficult thing. So I think that what you can do, uh, you can take a, your colleague with you who has also witnessed the same sort of uh, things. You can take a senior nurse with you and, and discuss with them that this is a problem you have identified. They are ex ex exceptionally good doctors but they are not good subordinates. They need to learn how to be an effective and a good subordinate and accept you as a boss. Work-life balance is very important. Uh, when you are sucked into the work, you come in the morning and by the time you're going home, it's six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, sometimes you, and when you go home, you're tired. So my advice is finish on time whatever your time says. If it finishes at five, finish at five. If you're not on call, finish it. Just shut everything down and leave. So finishing on time is very important. That will create a habit in you that you're always returning home on time. And when you are leaving the hospital, put the switch off mode. Forget about the day, forget about the patient, forget about the colleagues, just switch off, totally switch off. And, and go into the home mode. You need to develop some hobbies. The things which you enjoy, reading a book, gardening, keeping a pet, playing with the kids, playing with the computer games, whatever your hobbies are, put your time into that because that is going to give you relaxation, watching movies, listening to the music, whatever it is, talking to the friends, going out for the meals, whatever it takes. You do that uh, and, and have the time with the families, with the friends. This is very, very important. In our careers, we have come across the difficult colleagues. Now, the difficult colleagues are the one who are very, very inflexible. 
they are unhelpful they could be rude they could undermine you uh, in front of other people whenever you're dealing with them my advice is that you need to have a very professional behavior you do not raise your voice when you're speaking to them sometimes they can uh, they will try to uh, put an anger in you but my advice is don't raise the voice because when you raise the voice you lose the control right in any situation you need to be in control and the best way of being in control is that you are calm you are composed and you are not raising your voice and then you need to communicate with them and you need to say listen mr so and so mr doctor so and so uh, it feels to me at the moment that your voice or your tone your body language is threatening so please observe that communicate with them and it's also very important to document all those things if if you have a, a argument or anything just go and document it and and have a reflection on that it's also very important when these things happen that you need to talk to your peers you need to talk to your management your seniors that this thing is causing a problem in future it could escalate to a higher level so once you have addressed that and it's already there in a communication form you have sent an email or you have spoken to them there is a record of that so that's going to support you rather than them in case of a further conflict or an investigation or anything like that so but my advice is professional behavior not raising the voice communication and if things are going to escalate walk away from that situation okay do not get indulged in that fire just walk away from that and some um, the last point which i would like to say which i would say no go areas okay there 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 should be no go areas where you should never go and one thing is you need to think not once not twice multiple times multiple times if you are thinking of becoming a whistle blower okay you're seeing a wrong practice you're seeing something being done badly you're seeing something and it is your natural instinct that you want to correct it you want to say that you want to bring it up but remember one thing multiple times think before you do anything or whistle blowing because sometimes it can backfire uh especially when you are taking an organization the whole organization with all its power uh, they have got the legal power they have got everything and and you are fighting with them and for me it is just like a one man army fighting with a superpower so you are going to lose uh, even if you are going to win it will take a very long time and my uh, i give you an example there was a very brilliant uh, cardiologist with the name of Ra dr raj mattu i am taking his name because it's in the public domain now uh, raj mattu was a consultant in coventry in early 2000 he has noticed that in his coronary care unit the beds were become were more close and and he thought that this is for patient safety things are not right so he addressed that with the hospital management and then hospital management went into the argument with him and and he tried to raise the issue that this is patient safety management or all those things then the management what it did that they got some junior doctors to make a complaint against him on bullying so 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 he and the as the complaints went in the hospital suspended him from the work they say so oh, you you are a bully and the, now this thing went on and on and on in the courts and ultimately it was decided in 2010 or 2011 that raj mattu is right the hospital has done wrong to him and hospital must have paid him some money maybe 1 million 2 million 3 million i don't know what the money was but if if you google raj mattu and things you 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 you'll read about the whole case but what it did that it 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 ruined his career as a cardiologist okay he might have got 1 million 2 million 3 million but the money cannot 
bring those 10 years back when he was an aspiring cardiologist. So he did not work as a cardiologist for 10 years. He lost all his skills or whatever. So you can imagine the job you have been trained to do that and love it. So it's very important, my advice to you guys, or young, all younger than me, that think multiple times before you whistle blow. Okay. And I think I've done my time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Inti. Um, so we have about 10, 12 minutes for this. So if you want to ask questions, please unmute yourself and, uh, and feel free to ask. <coughs> Now, one question regarding the COVID management that I wanted to ask. Is there a role of antibiotics? Uh, and if so, what antibiotics usually people are using worldwide nowadays? Thank you for the question. Um, so yes, uh, uh, part of the presentation that I didn't get to, yes, there, uh, in patients who have uh, uh, moderate to severe, uh, moderate, severe, or critically ill. We do treat them with uh, bacterial, uh, for bacterial pneumonia and with antibiotics. Um, and we guide the management according to their, uh, their culture. Even if the cultures are negative, we go ahead and empirically treat them. Um, and there is, uh, it depends upon the biogram of your area. Um, it also depends upon whether they are coming from the community or uh, they are uh, healthcare associated pneumonia. So we, the antibiotics would have to be cho chosen accordingly. Uh, because, because I, I asked this question because uh, I am sort of involved in management, the, managing the COVID patients. And uh, in, in, in Pakistan, especially in Karachi, we are having a very good effect of levofloxacin. And it also helps to reduce the cytokine storm. Uh, that's something that I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for um, bringing it. Uh, I did not see any data specifically related to Levacor. Yes, exactly. um, mm -hmm. uh, and I also, there have been reports, some uh, initial interest in uh, azithromycin. However, um, azithromycin um, itself, they are, the trial is still enrolling and uh, the preliminary findings are not out. Uh, but I have, but maybe where you are practicing the uh, Levaquin 750 milligrams does have a good uh, penetration in the lungs. So um, maybe that's why part of it is a bacterial co infection. Okay. I have a question for you, Bella. Okay. okay. So I want to know about something about the hydrochloroquine because I have a couple of patients in my clinic even came and no symptoms, no nothing. And uh, he, one of the patient is like a truck driver and he was telling me I'm going everywhere all over the US. I want a hydrochloroquine. So I have to spend at least 35 minutes to explain it to him. There is nothing there. So go ahead with, I want to take your. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mashoud, for the question. Um, hydrochlor uh, hydroxychloroquine has been recommended against to be used in uh, the care of uh, COVID-19 patients for any kind of uh, disease, a, a disease spectrum, mild, moderate, severe. There was no data they are ex actually saying that they, they would not recommend anybody to use it. And this is thanks to our president that uh, people keep coming and then when, I, when we say no, then they escalate it to the practice manager. But I mean, we, probably you, it's hurting, it's harmful rather than uh, even neutral. Yeah. So I think a lot of I think a lot of COVID management has been hampered by the WhatsApp issues and the Facebook posts and the WhatsApp things and all that conspiracy theories. I think this also this also has has in, in, in fact in Pakistan it has also harmed a lot of patients because people are thinking the uh, this is some time of, of of conspiracy that's going on and then uh, different type of medicines are being used. Yes, you are right in, in this regard. Yes, and uh, thank you for saying that, uh, uh, Sarosh and Mashud, uh, that uh, there are certain adjunctive therapies that uh, were touted that, you know, you, oh, does vitamin C help? That would vitamin D help? Would zinc help? Actually, people started taking therapeutic doses of zinc. So the society exactly. said that there is no, it is against, you guys are causing, uh, don't do it. This is against our recommendations. And it takes a lot of, uh, 
lot of time to say that it is against and also as part of our medical community because of lack of data we did not do a good job because initially uh, we, we had a protocol in multiple hospitals saying do not use IV steroids then we had a protocol saying do not use NSAIDs and then this recovery trial came out that you know now we are now we have to revise all the protocols and then we, we were we were writing don't use yes, yes. Uh, NSAIDs and now we had to use NSAIDs so and then we were uh, intubating the patients early on oh everybody and gets yeah, then, intubated yes, yes. and then we said wait a minute why don't do that then there was data about the high flow oxygen uh, supplementation then we were Give, uh, doing the same ARDS net protocols that we had been dealing with for every other patient, but it turned out that yes, this is a novel virus and it has a low, uh, it causes hypoxemia and it does better with a uh, uh, higher level of tidal volume. As compared, what, like, what about uh, what about the use of use of BiPAP and yeah, prone yeah. position of the patient patient pro, keeping the patient prone in in, in is, is, uh, because we are using that and we are getting very good results for this because, because of doing this. Absolutely. Um, awake prone positioning uh, for six, 12 to 16 hours if your patient's been yes. tolerated on, um, on uh, high flow nasal cannula, on BiPAP, especially with a nasal interface, you will get better results and they are, rec they are, they are recommending. We have had very good results in our hospitals. We have, we have prevented few um, worse things. Um, having said that, do not use awake, pro uh, um, awake prone position in a patient with refractory if, just to prevent an intubation. They, you have, if patient doesn't do well in one day and patient continues to worsen, just go ahead uh, and uh, try uh, from from oxygen to nasal flow cannula to um, uh, CPAP, BiPAP, and then eventually intubate. And also when you intubate patients, make sure that don't, don't let, uh, I feel bad for the residents. I feel bad for the fellows that mm. because of that, their, their training has been uh, affected. Do not let a trainees to be, uh, to attempt intubations. You have, you got to have one shot. You have to have uh, either an anesthesiologist or an intensivist who does it for a living. And you cannot have so many people in the room, only three people. Sabella, thank um, you very much uh, for that. I see we've got a couple of things for Sabella and um, something for Dr. Malik. Um, I think an excellent talk, Sabella, actually just um, highlighting the overall COVID management. Thank you very much for responding to the call. Um, I just actually wanted to, um, first of all, talk about sort of the management. I think we were all kind of thrown in the dark when it all started because, you know, it was evolving. It was spreading on a sort of regular basis. I were full. We weren't really kind of actually sure what to kind of uh, give and what not to. And um, myself being actually a COVID sort of uh, effectee, um, you know, just given antibiotics, to be honest. Uh, but many people kind of actually were kind of just literally hungry for the data. Um, I think I think you, you've you've highlighted a really nicely on all the management. Just want to kind of actually highlight about from despair basically, um, that you know uh, about one of the causes um, or the side effects of actually acute kidney injury. So we have used it um, in our renal patients as long as actually they're on the filter on dialysis because it's really excreted. Um, it has got renal elimination because of the side effects or because of actually the uh, these sort of metabolites that we don't really use in patients who are on CKD stage five, CKD stage four, who are not on dialysis. So just to clarify that point about acute kidney injury, so if someone actually wants to use remdesivir in their renal patients, if they are on filter or dialysis, please do use if that's clinically indicated. And uh, uh, if not, then we can actually use it to close them up with the other um, sort of agents. Um, so this was actually about your presentation and uh, thank you very much. And Dr. Malik, just uh, not to forget the importance of actually being really nice to your secretary as a consultant because they do kind of actually, um, you know, take a lot of anger from the patient and filter that through. So I think, I think sec having a secretary, a really nice secretary actually does make your life as a consultant much easier. So these two points from my end. Yeah, and Inti, I also wanted to... Um, to ask about uh, you know, the, I, I, the training, that, when, uh, very little training that we receive, uh, especially people, you know, graduating from countries like Pakistan, for example, in terms of interpersonal skills and dealing with difficult colleagues. Um, and then we, we come abroad and then we find ourselves in difficult situation. We are now going for courses. We are now going to attend different seminars and workshops. Do they help? And my second question is, should this be an integral part of the curriculum 
in in our country uh good question nasim uh, i think it should be a part of uh, a curriculum in a way that interpersonal skills if you look at now the medical schools in uk and other parts of the world they are developing all these new skills how they speak how they interact and how the team working and things um in unfortunately in pakistan when we were graduated and I'm, i'm not sure what the situation now is and i think it's, it's still the same that we uh, are yes, definitely it's the same yes so so, so it's the same where uh, nobody teaches us how to speak with the families how to speak with the difficult colleagues how to uh, deal with the difficult situations how to deal with an uncertainty what help and support is needed so you are very right that once we come to abroad we are thrown into the deep end and uh, without uh, teaching us how to swim and we learn how to swim ourselves or we yeah. drown yeah any more but questions i have a question any more questions yeah. Yeah. yeah i have i have a question you have time for one more question anyone yep yep thank you so much okay, has a question yeah. and then we yeah. conclude thank you assalamualaikum thank you that was a really good talk i appreciate the knowledge um so my quick question is um you know um you know their dimers are high and that's most likely inflammatory and you know like they're coming in and there's risk for pe and what not with the whole covid thing do we need to keep an eye on this patients on these patients once they're discharged for like i mean have you had cases where you know they developed like a dvt or something later down the road is that is there something like that you're aware of that we need to watch out for yeah. so there is uh, the and that both is was uh, uh, are the most uh, controversial topic um couple of things is that that uh, there is no role for routine Uh, monitoring for uh, the vte in patients who are currently um, hospitalized number one number two is that there is uh, you are go- you're not going to discharge these patients on um, prophylactic doses of uh, um, antithrombotics unless uh, you have a very good clinical reason um, there are certain high risk groups where you are going to need to do that that for um, and those groups are the similar high risk groups in patients without covid-19 infection like the cancer patients like the patients who have had uh, an acute uh, event in the recent past before they got the uh, thrombotics uh, before they got the covid-19 you may want to continue that but there is absolutely no role for uh, are even given aspirin or um, or even any prophylactic treatments for um, and monitoring the d dimers are not recommended in outpatient settings thank you very much subela thank you um, so with that we conclude our today's session we had two excellent talks thank you again to subela and dr malik and we will inshallah meet again uh, on the 13th of september next month if you of the certificates please email your uh, from your email address your name full name to mansoor and i have all shared his email address in the chat uh, so for your cpd certificates please email him directly and um, uh, his email address is is there in the chat it's uh, mansoor dot ali at nhs dot net okay so see you see you next month then bye bye